Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Essential Principles of Power Part 2. My name is Guido Wolf and I'm the organizer of this webinar today. Before we start the webinar, I would like to share a few information with you about the webinar and our company. We'll be taking questions during the presentation and we'll answer them after we're finished. Um, when you have questions coming up during the session, please use the question section of your control panel and we'll answer them at the end of the presentations. Um, we will record this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow automatically. In case you would like to receive a PDF version of the presentations, just drop us an email and we'll be happy to share that with you. Okay, a few words about our company. Um, LaCroix was founded in 1964 by Walter LaCroix. Originally, we come from the uh, high energy physics uh, with uh, high speed digitizers, and our corporate headquarters is in Chestnut Ridge, New York. Um, today, we have the widest range of real time oscilloscopes uh, from 40 megahertz to 100 gigahertz real time and have a long history of innovations in oscilloscope technology. Besides that, we're also leading manufacturer of protocol analyzers. Um, and uh, the most recent change was in 2012 when we were taken over by uh, Teledyne Technologies. So we are now called Teledyne LaCroix. And the presenter of today's webinar is Ken Johnson. He's with our company 15 years or even longer. He's director of marketing and uh, a key product architect. Uh, he has uh, some degrees in electrical engineering and also holds some patents in the US for uh, some technologies of physical layer and protocol layer. So I'll hand thank over you, to thank Ken. Thank you, Guido. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and uh, we'll get started. We have a lot of material to cover. We will set a fast pace, so I hope if uh, you have questions, you can ask them at the end. We can always return, and there's also the video you can watch later, of course. So today we're going to talk about uh, part two of our series, and we're going to be focusing on power conversion uh, from the device all the way through the drive. And uh, so our agenda, uh, we're going to just do a very quick overview of power, um, and uh, the power transmission overview, let's say. And then we'll talk about power conversion drives. We'll talk about distorted waveform power calculations. And then we'll take questions and answers. All right, so I, I always say, you got to tell me what you mean when you say power, because it's like seeing the elephant if you're a blind person. You know, depending on where you touch the elephant, it can mean many different things. So when an engineer tells me they're doing something in power, I always ask, what power? And these are very, these are a few of the definitions of power that I run into all the time. And uh, it could mean any of these things. And these are all very, very different things. Uh, in, our, in our part one, we focused on line voltage and current and power, which is, you know, the sinusoids that get delivered to your home or business by the power company, the utility. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about power conversion. So it's not the sinusoids anymore. It's about the waveforms generated by these devices, and also uh, the output of the full drive. So I always like to do a very quick overview, uh, what I call 100 years in uh, seven slides. I actually think I made it eight slides in this presentation. Um, but basically, uh, as you all know, we generate, we transmit, and we distribute electricity. Historically, uh, electricity has been generated very centrally, but more recently, there's a lot of distributed generation going on, which is DC, which is then inverted to AC. Um, it's transmitted over a very long distance, in many cases, to your home or business, and then it's consumed. And it's either consumed directly from the AC, 50, 60 hertz line, with no power conversion, or there's some type of power conversion activity happening using power electronics before it's delivered to a load. Traditionally, this is what the utility generation, transmission, and distribution look like. Uh, basically, you have a big centralized plant, and it would send power one way to the user. So the power flow was one way. The power efficiency delivery was extremely low. 
that's shockingly low, um, and the devices that are stepping up and transmitting and stepping down power um, have a lot of losses in them. So these the substation and distribution and transmission transformers um, really have a lot of losses, as do the power cables. Historically, because of those losses, um, the people who made that equipment, the transformers and, and whatnot, would want to look at the losses in the core or in the coil uh, and understand what they were because the utility was very focused on this. So they they make the company making these transformers, they'd make them use a power analyzer to make measurements and measure all these things, and they'd have to give the utility a, a test report to say, hey, this is what the losses are. They're less than or equal to what we promised they would be. Also, motors. Uh, motors consume a huge percentage of the electricity that's delivered, um, almost half, and it's a tremendously large amount. The bigger motors consume the most power. It's, it's kind of like the 90-10 rule. 10% of the motors consume 90% of the electricity. Um, and those motors are primarily AC induction motors, and they were primarily line-powered prior to the 90s. Uh, drives are really a very new thing for motors. And so power analyzers, as you know them, um, basically were used to test these very large motors and make sure they met the efficiency claims that manufacturers had, because the initial purchase cost of the motor was one very small part of the whole operating cost of the motor over time. And so basically a company that made motors or bought them perhaps would put a motor on a dynamometer test stand. There'd be a load. They do a lot of static load testing and capture a bunch of numbers and they put a curve together and come up with some efficiency value or uh, a curve of some kind, efficiency versus load. This really wasn't what you'd consider an integrated design tool. Uh, didn't really show you a lot of waveform capture, or do dynamic measurements, but it was sufficient for this application. That's historically, uh, these two applications are historically what drove the need for power analyzers. Uh, today's power grid is evolving very rapidly. This looks a lot different from what you saw a few slides ago. You still have centralized plants, power's flowing out, but now you've got a lot of distributed generation. You've got high voltage DC, you've got solar, you've got wind, you might have uh, loads that both absorb and supply energy over time. Um, and so there's a lot of mini loads that are supplying power back and forth. You might be pulling power or supplying power to the distribution grid at any given moment in time. The solution to all of this is power electronics, both to manage the flow of power, to manage the power factor, the reactive power flows, and to invert and convert the, uh, the voltage in any step of this process. Power electronics and that, that uh, revolution, we could say, this conversion revolution, started out in the 80s with uh, small switch mode power supplies, uh, you know, from a 122 40 volt socket. That's your classic computer power supply. Um, and then it migrated up in voltage and power um, into smaller motors, then bigger motors, um, you know, and power converters that are the size of a refrigerator or larger. Um, grid-tied solar PV systems, very compact DC to DC converters for automotive applications, and now we're seeing the EV revolution really driving a lot of activity here. Um, in general, there's a quite a bit number of different tools that people might use. So there's a power analyzer, which measure three-phase power. The better ones integrate a motor, a torque sensor, and a speed sensor, so they can calculate mechanical power from that, and then they calculate efficiencies. Customers might use oscilloscopes to look at waveforms. Uh, could be a four-channel scope with limited capabilities or an eight-channel scope like this one here. More recently, we've introduced something that combines a lot of these functionalities into one instrument. So it's an eight-channel, 12-bit, very high bandwidth scope that also does three-phase mechanical uh, power analysis and, and does it in a static and a dynamic mode, not just numbers only, but dynamic and uh, with full waveform capability and capability for complete embedded control debug as well. Okay, so let's talk about power conversion. Um, these are the systems and circuits that convert line power to different voltages and frequencies or vice versa. So the definition really is, is power conversion, as I define it, is the conversion of electric power from one form to another, from one voltage to another, or one frequency to another, or some combination of those. Uh, it could be you know, AC to AC, DC to DC, or a combination of both in either direction. What it is not 
it's not a 50, 60 hertz step up transformer or step down transformer, what I call a core coil device. Um, it is um, something using power semiconductor switching devices operating at very high frequencies in the 1 to 100 kilohertz range. That's how we get the efficiencies. Um, the building blocks, uh, the power semiconductor building blocks, uh, either MOSFETs or IGBTs, um, you'll see both these in circuits. They, they have slightly different names for the same things. A MOSFET, we have the drain and the source. On an IGBT, we have a collector and an emitter. MOSFETs are generally uh, N-channel, uh, enhancement mode MOSFETs, and the IGBTs are generally P-channel minority carrier. Um, that's just the way it is that gets you better better efficiency, better overall operation in these kind of circuits. The way they work is you can think of this device, whether it's a MOSFET or an IGBT, as just a switch that opens and closes very quickly. When it's open, it has a blocking voltage. When it's closed, it has a current carrying capability and a very low resistance. Ken, for some reason, I cannot hear you. Looks like we have a problem with the audio.
We're sorry for the problems with the audio. Uh, Ken is connecting again. Looks like uh, he got disconnected uh, from his phone. Sorry for that. Ken has just informed me that uh, the phone system in the office has a problem and he's now dialing in with his mobile phone, so he should be back in any minute. So I'm sorry again, but I'm positive that we will continue shortly. Okay, I'm testing audio, and I'm hoping for some confirmation that I can be heard. I can hear you, Ken. Okay, great. All right. Uh, sorry about that. There seemed to be a problem with the phone connection. Uh, Guido, can you tell me what slide I should go back to? Um, just a few. I'll, I'll say stop. Just go back. Uh, it was a few slides. How about right there? I think this one. Okay, all right, so let's uh, continue where we left off. So basically for any power semiconductor uh, device, um, that, that gate voltage is floating at the DC bus, so you have to be very careful how you probe it. Um, you have to use one of two solutions. One could be an isolated device like a scope, which might be used by a facilities engineer, um, or uh, something with an isolated input of some other kind, or you could use a high voltage isolated probe, uh, which we make, uh, they're common, uh, they're a high voltage isolated differential probe, and that will protect the instrument and the operator when you want to look at that gate drive voltage. A power semiconductor device engineer is uh, quite common. Uh, commonly looks at uh, various characteristics of MOSFETs and IGBTs to understand the operation, specifically around the losses. And so they would look at the switching and the uh, conduction loss. They look at the voltage and the current, as shown here, and we could calculate the power from those quantities. Uh, current probes or voltage probes or even our differential amplifier are quite commonly used uh, to measure device loss characteristics. Just not only to double check the manufacturer's claims, but also to, to make a lot of additional measurements beyond what the manufacturer may provide. Um, today, a lot of MOSFETs and IGBTs are in silicon. Um, MOSFETs generally are used at lower voltages in what I would call 120, 240 volt application, whereas IGBTs are used in the 380, 480, 600 volt application. IGBTs have higher blocking voltages and can carry more currents. Um, they're a little less efficient, but they have 
better voltage and current carrying capability at higher voltages and currents. Um, usually used at a little slower switching frequency due to the power. MOSFETs generally switch higher, limited to the lower voltage applications. You may have heard of wide band gap devices. Uh, silicon carbide and gallium nitride are the two most common. So um, these are being more widely used. Uh, they do improve the efficiency because they have lower losses and they can be operated at faster speeds. Um, the higher speeds are nice. The higher switching frequencies are nice because you can use reduced size filter components, which means reduced heat sink sizes and lower weights and higher power densities. So uh, the disadvantage is uh, many people are still gaining design experience with them, so the reliability is still being ascertained, but this is the wave of the future. Um, and these will become increasingly more common over time. You may also have heard about uh, thyristors or um, uh, other devices. Um, these are really uh, historically used in very high voltage and very high power levels on utility scale equipment. Um, they have a lot of drawbacks. Uh, thyristors can be switched on just once a cycle. They can't go off again until you hit a zero crossing. So. Um, these are really declining in usage as IGBTs get better. Um, I'm going to skip a couple just to keep this on track here. Um, basically, uh, power semiconductors, once you have a device, you can now hook up two devices. You can either hook them up in a, a series half bridge like this to provide a higher voltage or in parallel to provide a higher current carrying capability. Um, and then you can start cascading multiple series legs like this um, to get uh, different types of operations as well. The only practical limitation to some infinite series parallel combinations are really increasing cost and increasing control complexity. Here are some very common building blocks for power conversion circuits. So the outline in blue is basically lower power, lower voltage, fewer semiconductors, and the outline is green is higher power, higher voltage, and more semiconductors. So these kinds of topologies, of course, these are really greatly simplified, but these kinds of topologies are really um, like very typical of a switch mode power supply or a computer power supply or a very small DC to DC converter or an LED driver or something like that. Um, the half bridges are more common for the switch mode power supplies or a lighting ballast. Um, and then as you get into uh, what we call a full bridge, it looks like two half bridges uh, in parallel and the load is connected across the midpoint of both. Um, you really could think of this as a single phase uh, bridge that's how it works. This is the single phase right here. And if you had one more leg, then you get three phases. You have one phase across there, another phase across there, and another phase across there. So by adding two more devices, you go from one to three phase. You increase the uh, capability of the drive or the power conversion circuit a lot. And uh, you don't increase the cost all that much. So three phases is very, very common on motors especially. And uh, even very, very small motors where you might think don't really have a need for three-phase because they're such low power, but they, they're, they utilize three-phase for control characteristics. OK, so how do we get the power conversion device to switch the way we want? So basically, um, I'll give you an example. This is a carrier-based pulse width modulation technique. There are other methods, but this is very good for, uh, to explain. So basically, there's a modulating waveform that defines the frequency um, that we want to carry in the output voltage. Then there's a high frequency uh, carrier waveform that's generated. It's at this 1 to 100 kilohertz frequency. I've, I've shown it here to be much slower than that, um, just so it makes the example a little easier to follow. And then basically where the carrier wave and the modulating frequency intersect with each other, um, we can then determine the width of a pulse. So the pulse will be either high or it will be low based on the intersection of the carrier and the uh, modulating frequency. So this is a simple example. It's just meant to be illustrative, but this is the most basic way uh, to do this. Now, if you had a single stage, as I showed earlier, one device, and we'll call this a boost. This is typically thought of as a boost. So basically, your power semiconductor is going to open and close based on the signal getting from the gate drive. And it's going to deliver a signal that looks like this on the output. right? So if this is zero. If it was a 120 volt DC bus or something like that, um, then, then this would be 120 volts hot, right? So, and then basically the signal output would look like this. So here would be your pulse width modulated. Your sine wave, it's only going to be delivering power 
uh, kind of in the positive direction here. So you might have a positive and negative modulating sine wave, but it's going to deliver a positive voltage in this regard. It's going to look like this green pulse width modulated signal on the output. Now, if I had a, uh, a half bridge with the load connected across the midpoint here, then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to have two different gate drive signals. They'll be what's called complementary. So um, if you kind of look at this one, when this one is low, this one is high. When this one is low, this one is high. So they're operating in a very controlled, complementary way. And uh, they're both not on at the same time. So there is always going to be some dead time where neither of them are, are on or off uh, around a certain period of time, just to avoid mistakes. If you have them both on at the same time, then there's a short circuit straight through here, which is not good. That's going to destroy the device and the, and the circuit. Um, and so then the output across the load is really the summation of what you see here. It's the summation of these two outputs. This is the one output going high. This is the second output um, also high. And when you sum them together, now you get the zero volt is really a 50% pulse width. And then a highest positive voltage would be close to 100% pulse width. And highest negative would be close to 0% pulse width. So this is how the, uh, the circuit operates. If you take two of these bridges, half bridges, and put them in parallel, and then connect the load across them, well, now you don't need to have the complementary uh, switching on both devices on the same leg. Now what you do is you control the on-off so the power flows through the load, just like that. So it will flow from the DC. It will flow down through the load, and then it will flow out through the other device. And so basically, you can control by controlling the switching at each one of these different devices, um, you can control the, um, the power flow. The voltage across the load now is going to look more like the sinusoid we kind of know from our classic AC uh, line frequency and power and voltage and current. Now the, the highest voltage here of the sinusoid that you'd like to impress upon your, on your load is going to be related to maximum pulse width positive, and then the lowest would be maximum pulse width negative. OK, so here's what I was describing before. If I want to control the load and have the voltage and, and apply it across here and the current flowing this way, then I'd switch this device and this device. And that would bring the current through that load in that regard. And my waveform would look like that. And then if I wanted to control it in a different way, I could do that. So then I could control this device and control this device and have the power flow this way. So basically, I can get a positive or a negative current flow. And I can also do some other things. For instance, if this was a single phase motor drive, I can route the current flow this way. And that would break the motor when it was running in a positive direction. Or I could route the current flow this way, and that would break the motor when it was running in the negative direction. Or I could just device switch everything off and have no current flowing in the circuit, let the motor coast down. So there's a lot of opportunities. A full bridge like this gives me a lot of capability to control. Now, if I add one more leg and I have a three phase, that's called a cascaded H bridge. So that does the same thing that the single phase case does, except now I'm controlling three different legs and three different power flows across the different phases uh, independently at the same time. And these are commonly called, on the output of the drive, it's commonly called U, V, and W, or sometimes R, S, and T. It depends. So um, from phase to phase or line to line, if this is U and that's V, this would be U to V. That would be V to W, and that would be W to U. And so um, it's typically called a line to line or a phase, uh, phase to phase. There are a few different methods to create the, uh, the waveforms. Um, so you could have a what we call a sign modulated, which is either carrier-based PWM with some very simple control or very complex phase vector modulated control. Um, and then there's also another method called six-step commutative. And I'll talk about both those in just a minute. But first, I'd like to ask you to answer this polling question. Um, what power conversion topology do you generally utilize in your designs? And if you choose one answer uh, from this list, I would greatly appreciate it. And Guido, uh, let me know when, uh, when we're ready to, uh, to continue on. Okay, we'll give uh, 
just a little bit more time for uh, additional answers here. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Um, this does help me understand the kinds of participants we have uh, attending our webinar, and it's greatly appreciated. Okay, we'll give just a few more seconds. It looks like some answers are still coming in. And when Guido closes down the poll, I will continue on. We still get some feedback. Okay. Uh, I, I cannot see the feedback screen, so I'm yeah. counting on you. I to... think you can you can continue. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so I talked about a few different control techniques um, with this cascaded H bridge. Um, if we were going to do a sign modulated control, with, with, which is generally a very simple control using like a carrier uh, a sine wave modulating sine wave, as we described earlier. You know, one example would be I'd, I'd really have three different modulating sine waves, one for each one of these loads. And they would just be shifted to be 120 degrees apart because the three phase signals need to be 120 degrees apart. And um, I would just essentially employ three different triangle uh, carrier frequencies with three different modulating waveforms. And if, if I was to try to envision what my output is desired to be, I would see something that would look like this at time equals zero. My line to neutral voltage, which I now call R, S, and T to N, to neutral. Um, at that point right there, time equals zero, I'd have some positive voltage on uh, S, and I'd have some positive voltage on T, and I'd have a negative voltage on R, right, as I kind of described right here. And from that information, at any given time point, we can calculate in a control system the PWM signals that we need to be supplied to these different gate drives to create the current flows consistent with the operation we wanted. And so, for instance, at that point, the point I just described, it would look like this. I'd, I'd have, um, obviously, this is not time equals uh, T. This is a, a longer acquisition showing the full envelope. But at time equals zero, I would switch my different drives like this. So this device R, the upper device, would be off. This would be on. This would be um, on and switching PWM negative. And then these would be switched as described here. And the power flows that would result would result in current flows like this. So every, every part of that drive would have some voltage applied to it. And current would be flowing in the direction of the arrows. There's another, uh, there's another methodology as well called six-step commutation. And it's a little bit different uh, because only voltage is only applied across two phases at any given point in time. So, and there are six steps to this, uh, let's say, decision-making or commutation process. And these steps are determined by using Hall sensors that are embedded in the rotor of the motor. So this is very common in lower cost motor drives. These Hall sensors, the three of them, generate a, a basically a three-bit digital pattern that defines these six steps. And um, you, know, you can see here, this is Hall sensor on the R, the S, and the T phase. So that's a 0, a 0, and a 1. So that's 0, 0, 1, so forth. There's no 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0, 0. So out of this 3-bit pattern, there are six different states, which is why it's called uh, six-step commutation. So basically, then, in that case, what we're doing is we're only applying voltage across any two phases at any given time. And um, what that means is the control system is a little more simplified. Um, it's not quite as uh, sinus at the end of the day, which is why the, the other system is called sinusoidal. And this will be called brushless DC, perhaps, or six-step, or something like that. These are what the signals look like. This is what they would look like for a line-to-line -line voltage measurement. And you can really see the six steps here when you look at the, uh, the R to neutral, or in this case, R to reference. And here we've got no voltage on, on the R winding, no voltage on the R winding in these two steps, and then some voltage, 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 some voltage, and then no voltage. So when you look at it, R to reference here, in this case, you can really see the two steps where no voltage is being applied and four steps where it is. Um, there's another topology uh, that I'll talk about, and it's what's called a multi-level uh, or even a neutral point clamp. NPC inverter. It's really just two cascaded H-bridges that are connected together. 
and then the load is connected across here. Um, this is a, a nice topology to reduce the amount of harmonics because instead of having something with an envelope that looks like this, you have something with an envelope that looks more sinusoidal. So the harmonics are lower. It's also more scalable to greater than 600 volt uh, class outputs. So you see these maybe in very high voltage applications as well. But it is more complex and costly to implement on the control side. Uh, this is a DC to DC converter. Um, this is very typical uh, for like a high voltage for vehicle application where you're maybe stepping down the bus voltage from 400 volts to maybe 12 volts to supply uh, uh, utility power to the different uh, aspects of the vehicle. So if I have my high voltage bus voltage right here, I simply use an H-bridge inverter with the output across this inverter down to some sort of step down, very high frequency transformer, and then there'd be a synchronous or an active rectifier here and that gives me my low voltage 12 volts output. All right, so a quick summary. Uh, there's a lot of different topologies for power conversion. Uh, it's really chosen based on the application. We talked about all four of these basic. This is the, the vast majority of the ones we'd see. And you'd really start getting into more, more power semiconductors and applications where you needed higher power or three phase, or you wanted to have bi-directional power flow. That's really where that comes into play. There's a few different uh, techniques used to modulate the output. There's a sign modulated technique, which we talked about, and also a six-step commutation. There's also really a couple different ways to do the sign modulation. Carrier frequency is what we described. There's also something called the space vector or a space vector modulation or vector controls. And that's a more complicated way to do it. Um, we won't get into the detail of that here, but that's also what, what would be commonly referred to as the sign modulated method. And just keep in mind, if you've ever seen a lot of different types of output waveforms from a power conversion device and you're wondering why, it really, it's really based on the topology and also it's based on the modulation technique. The six-step commutation looks quite a bit different from the uh, sine modulation techniques. Okay, so now let's talk about a drive. Um, you know, this is where everything comes together. Uh, the inverter subsection, that power conversion section is one part of the drive. So what is a drive? Uh, a drive is really something that converts line AC, um, you know, typically 50 or 60 hertz, or it could work directly from a battery as well, um, to a variable frequency AC output. So a drive contains uh, like the line input or the battery input, some rectifier section with filtering and energy storage. Uh, there's the inverter subsection, which are those bridges that we talked about before. Um, the gate drivers, that is the information that tells the inverter subsection to switch in a certain way. Uh, and then there's an embedded control system with some sort of user interface uh, and feedback sensing. A motor drive is just a drive that powers a motor in a controlled manner and usually to achieve very high efficiencies or very, very defined operating characteristics, more defined than would be possible with a straight line AC signal. So these also have usually torque and speed feedback signals as well. Okay, so we'll run through the block diagram very quickly. Uh, we talked about AC power in part one of this series. Um, so that comes in here, it gets rectified. I've got some filtering and some energy storage and a capacitor. And so that gives me a nice stiff DC bus. And then I've got my inverter subsection, which is that, in this case here, it's that cascaded H-bridge. I showed you before, the output of that are these PWM type waveforms that you see right here. The uh, inverter subsection is controlled by the high voltage isolated gate drivers and there's an embedded control system behind that that controls the gate driver circuit and takes all the user input and output commands. So in within that control system, basically, let me go back one slide, I went very quick. So within this control system right here, there is some sort of methodology that's employed to tell the gate drive circuit what to do, right? So basically, there could be one of three basic control algorithms. You could certainly describe a lot more and I'll touch on that. But these are probably the most common ones. We'll call this a scalar. It's also called a volts per hertz or a V per hertz. This is very simple, low cost. Uh, sign modulated control. This would be something like what you'd see maybe in a ceiling fan or a blower control. It doesn't require a lot of control capability, but it's good for very simple applications. 
Um, a safe step commutated is really specific to what I call a brushless DC uh, drive using Hall sensor technologies to measure rotor speed and, and uh, position. It's medium complexity and cost. It's very common. It's a pretty good control capability if you only need, let's say, speed or only torque control. Um, and you don't need to control that uh, too, in a too defined a way. So it's very common in power tools or small pumps, things like that. The drawbacks of this are you can get quite a bit of torque ripple from it. Um, and that might not be good depending on your application. You, you wouldn't want torque ripple or a pulsing of the output shaft on your hybrid vehicle for, per se. But on a small pump that's moving water through your hydronic heating system, that's not such a big deal. Or on a power drill. Um, so the cost, cap the cost is very favorable for those applications. And there's no real trade-off on the performance. When you get into high performance, you'll typically hear a lot about vector field-oriented controls, or FOCs. These are high complexity and cost. They're a sign modulated uh, technology. They're very good for simultaneously controlling torque and speed. Um, they're becoming lower cost. Um, but it can be a very complex system depending on the application. It's not uncommon for a vector field-oriented control to have a, to have a microprocessor in your control system that's several hundred megahertz. So it's, it's uh, not uncommon at all. And you'll see these kind of drives in HVAC systems or electric vehicle propulsion where they, they really like a very complex level of control. This is, a, uh, this is just a hierarchy of various different types of variable frequency drive controls used in motor drives specifically. And so this is kind of how it breaks down. The vector control, you could really break that down into lots of different other categories. Um, Typically, it's a rotor flux-oriented uh, control system. Larger AC induction motors might use a direct con torque control, which is, uh, is really, is really a, a very different from a field-oriented control. It, it tries to achieve a more simplified approach. Um, but it's using that same kind of space vector modulation technique to, uh, to control the, uh, the gate drivers. All right, so if you're, uh, if you're using a motor drive, let me ask you this question. Um, what control methodology do you use in your designs? And you can choose all that apply. So the scalar, uh, the six-step, a vector FOC, or if you're not using motor drives, just simply none of the above. So we'll, we'll pause for a couple moments here and let you answer this question. And I will ask uh, Guido to let me know when we should proceed. Uh, Guido, I don't see an indication on my display that the pole yes. is in, in, in operation. Ah, I see it now. Okay, we'll give just a few more moments. And OK, now we'll proceed. Thank you very much for answering that question. So now, uh, if we look at our, um, if we go to our next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the user and system command inputs here. So for instance, um, if it was part of a, if the drive was in an industrial system, you might have a plant management system uh, through Ethernet uh, telling the drive what to do. Or you might have some user commands going directly in. You know, it could be as simple as a knob on the wall or a, a, a pedal on your hybrid vehicle or something like that. It's important to know that the drive system needs a lot of feedback. So it's quite common if it's a motor drive, uh, especially, to get feedback from the uh, drive output directly into the motor control system, to take feedback from the DC bus, and also to take feedback uh, from the gate drives. And so that just helps the uh, control system understand how to calculate uh, what it needs to keep the drive operating in the optimal condition. Once you put a motor on there, typically you're going to also sense something about the motor. You want to sense the shaft or the speed uh, position, and also maybe the torque, uh, depending on what the tool is. So if, uh, if you do that, then these are additional things that are brought into the system, either as analog signals, which are digitized by the control, or directly as digital lines. In the example of the brushless DC, you've got the three hall sensors coming in or 
for a permanent magnet motor, it could be a quadrature encoder or a resolver or something like that. Uh, we've created this product called the Motor Drive Analyzer. It has all the characteristics you know from the scope, except it has eight channels, and it has 12 bits of resolution and a gigahertz of bandwidth. And it, it does perform three-phase power analysis and motor integration. So when you look at this full circuit here, um, it really takes care of all those different requirements. Um, one last comment about drives. Uh, a lot of people may have a misconception about what a drive can be. We talked about these very sing, uh, simple H-bridge type circuits for single phase. Well, here's a very small single phase motor drive. You know, you can see, you know, four devices right here on the board. Here's my DC bus capacitor. You know, something this simple. Um, you know, it's not so uncommon. You know, if this, if this was three phase, it would look not much different. And it might be powering a power tool uh, from an 18 volt battery or something like that. Uh, then it can get a little bit bigger, maybe the size of a deck of playing cards or, or something like that and operate at 120 volts. Um, size of a shoebox, for instance, that might power a one horsepower motor, or an array of different sizes to go up to thousands of horsepower, you know, something the size of a, a room, you know, your, your cubicle or your office uh, even. Um, so they can they range the gamut. Um, it all depends on the application and the motor that's being connected. All right, so this is our last polling question, and then we'll go on to the next section. Let me ask you, uh, what equipment do you use today uh, for measuring power or debugging power conversion circuits? So I ask you, just choose all that apply, a four-channel scope, eight-channel scope, a power analyzer. Maybe you have one of our motor drive analyzers, or maybe you're, you're not using any of these things. So just take a couple moments and answer that question for me, please. Okay, we seem to still be getting a few more answers, so we'll just keep this poll open just a little bit more, and then we'll continue. Uh, the next section we'll cover are the distorted waveform power calculations. Okay, the last answer is coming in. And I will take my cue from Guido as to when I should continue. Okay. We're back. Uh, let's keep moving forward here. So the, uh, the next topic we want to cover is how do we measure power in a distorted waveform uh, situation? So obviously, the pulse width modulated waveforms we're showing you, those are really highly distorted. They have a lot of harmonic content in them. Um, they have multiple frequencies. The simple techniques that we, we may have described previously or that you may be familiar with, where you can measure power on a single frequency sinusoid, cannot be used to these kind of waveforms. So we'll describe what can be done. So first of all, let's just remind ourselves what is a distorted or a square wave waveform look like and what is it composed of? Well, it's really a complex sum of sinusoids. So here's one example here. Let's imagine this red waveform is my uh, square wave. Not a perfect one because I've limited to the seventh harmonic. So that waveform there contains a fundamental. Uh, and then it also contains uh, it contains this primary, right? Then it contains a third harmonic, a fifth harmonic, a seventh, a ninth, and et cetera, and so on. And when I sum all those up in their different magnitudes, I get something that looks like this. If I had out to the 70th harmonic, then I get something that looks more like a perfect square wave. So, um, so if you think of your square wave or your PWM waveform as being lots of different sinusoids, remember, each voltage and current of different magnitude contributions from different harmonic orders. And the phase relationships between the voltage and current waveforms for all these different harmonic orders is not a constant. It'll be different for each harmonic. Therefore, you can't use a phase angle calculation method between a voltage and current signal to calculate the real power from the apparent power. It just can't be done. Um, so what do we do? Um, we use a digital sampling technique, and this is a, a this is used um, by any modern acquisition system that's involved in power measurement on these kind of waveforms. So this is not proprietary to us. Uh, this technique is used by many different types of instruments and manufacturers. And basically, we're showing this here on a sinusoidal waveform, right? 
um, but it could be PWM. And basically what we do is we do digital sampling. This is just what an oscilloscope does um, to make digital samples. And we don't capture the analog waveform. We capture the analog waveform as a series of sample points. So once we do that, um, we have to find uh, something else out. We, once we know all those sample points, we also have to group those sample points into measurement intervals. And so we need to know which period uh, is period one, which period is period two, which period is period three, so we can make calculations over just this period. I can't make a power calculation over one and a half periods. It'll be incorrect. I have to restrict it to a period. So we choose one signal of many that we're trying to measure in a three phase or a single phase system. And we use that as what we call our sync signal. And we detect the zero crossing. This is an actual uh, sync signal right here. This actually started off as a PWM signal. And we filtered it to 500 hertz. And then we applied a hysteresis setting. And that gave us something that looked like a sinusoid, which had very delineated zero crossings. And you can see this transparent overlay. There's like a greenish, then there's a purplish, then there's a greenish and a purplish alternating. That basically is showing the period that we're defining based on this information we set right here. Um, so that helps us understand our uh, zero crossing and our period detection for our power calculations. And once we know where all the periods are on all the digitally sampled waveforms, then we can group the points into period one, period two, et cetera, and we can apply some calculations. And the way we apply the calculations, basically, is we, I'll show it to you mathematically, but basically it says, know the number of sample points, um, make sure they're all aligned, and then multiply the sample points by each other to achieve various quantities restricted to within each period, and return multiple results for multiple periods. So what that looks like mathematically is, if I'm trying to measure the RMS voltage over one period, then what I do is, for period one, represents I equals one to N periods for period one, I look at the sample point set contained within period one, which is what this is saying right here, and I just multiply all those, I, I do a calculation on all those sample points for voltage, and the RMS calculation is basically just the square root of the, uh, the uh, uh, squares, and I take the average of that for each sample point, and I get my RMS voltage value. And I do the same for current, and I calculate power by knowing what my uh, instantaneous voltage times current values are based on the sample points. And I calculate a power for a given period. And then once I know my real power in watts for my instantaneous voltage and current sample points, then I can calculate, uh, and I know my RMS quantities, then for any given period, I can calculate the apparent power, S, in volt amperes just by multiplying these two quantities. So for period one, I take the RMS value of voltage for period one times the RMS value in current for period one, and I get my apparent power. Reactive power then, Q in VARS, is simply then calculated from the known quantities of the apparent and the real power. And then from all that information, I can calculate my power factor and my phase angle. So um, that, that is the way we get the per cycle value, and then you get a mean value. And this mean value is usually what's reported numerically in a power analyzer. The mean value is then just the average of all the per cycle values that you calculate. This, uh, there's a lot more information on how this is done for single phase, three phase, three phase, three wire, four wire, or two watt meter. All that detail, if you're interested, you can find it here um, in our Motor Drive Analyzer Software Instruction Manual. So if you if you really like more information on that, it's, it's available there. And what it looks like uh, realistically, if I were to capture all these waveforms, um, so we talked about a sinusoidal modulated drive. This is what it looks like. This is a permanent magnet synchronous motor. It's three phase. This is my first phase set, second, and third. I'm measuring voltage line to line here, which is why it's going high and then low, and then this is my current waveform right here. Now, if I zoom in on this area right here, defined by this white box, and I look at that, I can see my voltage is PWM modulated. The current, which just looks like kind of noisy right here, with our 12-bit with our scope, our resolution, you can see that there's actually a sawtooth there. And, and so what it's doing is it's either picking up interference from the, from the circuit or from the air, 
or there's some combination of that and the fact that the coil is getting charged when the voltage is high, so the current goes up, and then when the voltage goes low, the current goes down, so on and so forth. And so you can see that effect right there. These are power values calculated at the bottom here. So this is a mean value. You can see we're calculating the VRMS and IRMS, and then the, the power quantities, and then the angle and power factor here as well. And this is just taken from all the sample data. This table right here is very similar uh, to what you find in a, a standard power analyzer instrument. Um, one interesting thing is, is uh, you know, nothing's ever perfect. I mean, here's a nice situation where the drive is operating in a very well-behaved way. But here, um, the drive is just about ready to go into overload. Uh, it's starting to have some problems here. And you can see that this envelope is not so clearly defined. And when I look at the effect of that on the current, I can see that my current waveform now has quite a bit of oscillation on it. So the drive's in a, starting to operate in a very unstable mode. You can actually see that if I were to calculate THD on the current and on the voltage right here uh, on these quantities, I could see that the distortion went from roughly 1% or 2% to uh, more than 5% at this point. This is the brushless DC waveform. Uh, I showed this a little bit to you earlier. Um, by definition, you can see these signals right here, this green signal and this whitish and this dark blue signal here, these are the three current waveforms. They inherently have more distortion than a nice sine modulated permanent magnet synchronous motor type waveform. So they, um, yeah, that's, that's what causes this uh, higher torque ripple uh, that we described earlier. But it's still a very acceptable, widely used form of drive. In certain applications, it works perfectly fine, and it's very cost effective. This is, um, what this shows is a, a capture made with our, our motor drive analyzer I talked about earlier. This is an AC induction motor drive. It's about a one and a half horsepower drive. Um, and this is the AC input signal set here on this tab right here, this grid. And this is the drive output, the pulse width modulated. I used a two watt meter mode here so I could look at two voltages and two currents on the input and two voltages and two currents on the output. And then if you see this little sliver right here, this, this full acquisition is 10 seconds. This little highlighted sliver right here is shown here as a zoom. So this is what the signal looks like when you zoom right into it. So of course, on my AC input, my voltage, I expect to see sinusoids. You might have expected to see sinusoids on the AC uh, input for the current signals, but you don't. You don't because the current's being drawn nonlinearly. So as the, as the drive switches on and off, um, these pulse width modulated, it's pulling a very nonlinear load. So what you see is pulses like this on each one of those uh, on each one of those lines. It's not sinusoidal like you might expect. So whenever you put a nonlinear load on your on your wall socket output, let's say, uh, this is what you're going to see. So that's why distorted waveforms are far more common than people realize. And this is the drive output here. Uh, this is a uh, voltage envelope right here for the two lines I'm measuring. And then this here is the current. It looks pretty noisy. It is. It's drawing a relatively small load. There is a lot of uh, noise pickup uh, just in the environment from all the switching activity. Uh, but that is the current right there. You can kind of see the sine wave uh, you know, being delivered like that. Uh, these measurements over here, uh, we talked about the table here, the average values over the full acquisition. So yeah, this is a full acquisition. This is an average value for, let's say, RMS voltage or power over that 10 second time. But the load is changing a lot in that 10 seconds. So if you really wanted to see what the load is or what, what things are changing, you can touch on one of these and it will show a waveform of that value over time. So for instance, the efficiency is about 50% on average over that 10 second period. But it starts out very inefficient. And as, load, as it goes up to speed, it gets more efficient. Then less efficient as the speed stabilizes without a load. Then it becomes more efficient the more the load is put on it until um, it gets to this point out here, which um, looks to be about 65 or 70 percent efficient. So these are waveforms that show a per cycle value plotted over time. Um, this one's the efficiency. This one is the power factor. And it has the same type of profile. Uh, low power factor to start out increases as it's ramping up to speed, drops, 
when it ramps up to speed, but there's no load. And then the power factor improves and gets closer to one as the load is applied. Uh, different types of probes people use. Uh, lots of different things for voltage. They might use a, 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 a probe supplied with an oscilloscope like these here. Uh, these are differential. That's a passive probe. Or they might use a differential amplifier. Or they might use something you know, like from a third party. This is from a company called CIC Research. It's a higher voltage uh, version of this that's not handheld. Um, and a, or something like a potential transformer. Um, you know, depending on your application, you choose one over the other. Uh, it really depends on the application. Likewise with current, there's a lot of different capabilities. Uh, we make voltage probe or current probes. Uh, they reach all the way down to DC. Uh, pretty good accuracy, very high current. Um, there's other devices like this Danison CT. Uh, this is also rated down to DC. It has less uh, bandwidth, but the accuracy is better and it's very stable. Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of people, engineers, want to know what the DC performance is uh, to measure startup events, for instance. Uh, if you don't care about DC, you just care about AC, then there's more choices. You can use a, like a Rogowski coil, uh, like from PEM UK, or a Pearson CT, or a conventional terms ratio of CT uh, as well. And they have different levels and, uh, and types of performance. Um, they generally cost less, and they work fine, uh, as long as you stay within their rated operating characteristics. Just be aware with a conventional turns ratio CT, you could have a dangerous open circuit voltage on the output. Um, so you do always want to keep that terminated, not open circuited when you're using it. We make a device, makes it easy to get a current signal from a third party device into our scope. It's called the CA10. It's really just an adapter. It rescales the input into the scope, and it kind of makes makes your third party device operate like one of our probes. So a technician can plug it in and just have it work. It simplifies the setup and makes it 100% reliable. OK, quick summary. Um, distorted waveform power measurements. You know, the textbook descriptions you may hear for power calculations typically assume sinusoidal waveforms uh, for single phase systems, so one voltage and one current. In that case, you know the phase angle between the single frequency sinusoid. And you can use that for power calcs. But once you get distorted waveforms, which are very, very common, you have to use a different methodology. There's no practical way to measure the phase angle. So you have to use a digital sampling technique. And the good news is the digital sampling techniques also work for pure sinusoids. Just in closing, you can visit us at this address. It's teledynelacroix.com, static-dynamic-complete. Uh, we have some information on our uh, solution that we sell. Uh, you can also request a power poster, which is pretty cool. Um, this kind of goes through line voltage current and power. So this is like the part one that we covered before. Someday there will be a part two power poster as well. Uh, but this is the one you can request today. And we also have various videos and application notes uh, at that site. So it's teledynelacroix.com, and it's static, dynamic, complete. Okay, so now we'll pause for any questions. And I know these usually come in through uh, text. And so I'll ask Dito to please read out the questions. And um, we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to read them when they come in, Ken. OK, all right. Good, so I, I, I do apologize for the, uh, the voice problem we had earlier. And um, I'm glad we were able to come to some resolution of that. I might also add that in addition to uh, this website, there's also a product page on our solution. I did give a link earlier for the instruction manual. So that, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's quite a bit of information in that software instruction manual about how the unit operates. Uh, but it's very also very informative. It contains a lot of the information on, a, on the distorted waveform calculations as well, which is, which is quite informative. So today it seems pretty quiet with questions, Ken. Maybe you covered all. Okay. Okay. That that's probably good news. So I I do thank everybody for your time, and I appreciate you attending our webinar. And um, uh, if you have any questions, you can reach me. I think my email address was at the beginning of the slide uh, presentation, and Guido will be sending that out. You will get that automatically. 
and uh, certainly feel free to contact us if you have any questions or would just like to communicate on your needs uh, or anything like that. We're happy to listen. So thank you again. There will be a part three that's coming up in a few weeks, and uh, I hope you all attend that as well.